Former New York Giants quarterback Eli Manning joins the podcast today. We're talking Giants. We're talking progress. We're talking Daniel Jones. And we're also talking about his latest marketing initiative with Quaker Oats. That's coming your way next. Our Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of the Locked on Giants podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked on Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Traina. Happy to have you with us on this Tuesday and on today's Locked on Giants podcast. We're going to hear from the one and only Eli Manning, who is not only making his NFL coaching debut this week, again, coming up in the Pro Bowl uh, against his brother Peyton, but uh, we talked a little bit about the Giants, picked his brain a bit. Um, We also talked about his latest marketing initiative with Quaker Oats. So that is coming up in the first two segments of today's show. And then the third segment We're going to continue with answering questions that are submitted through um, Twitter and through email. And if you want to submit a question to me via email, you can do so. Um, The email address is in the show notes, but it's LockedOnGiantsPodcast at gmail.com. And uh, I'm going to try and answer um, a couple at least uh, if I have them on each show. So this way we kind of keep up with everything rather than just do one every other week when you know, there's probably not going to be as many questions as there usually is during the season. So that's today's agenda. So without any further ado, let's bring on the interview with Eli Manning that I taped on Monday. I'd like to thank you as always for coming on the uh, pod with me. I appreciate it. It's always good to see you. Um, Folks, we're going to talk a little bit about a new marketing initiative Eli has with Quaker Oats. But before that, we got to talk a little football. Got to, right, Eli? <clears throat> Excuse sure. me. Uh, first off, Eli, I hope your offseason has been going well. Um, I wanted to talk about the Giants, the latest with the Giants. Of course, they um, surprised a lot of people, I think, with, with the, what they were able to accomplish. And um, you once went through a new system, kind of like what Daniel went through when um, uh, when Coach Gilbride retired and Coach McAdoo came in. How much easier is it for a quarterback when you're in year two of, of the same system as opposed to, you know, starting from scratch? How much better do you think Daniel and the offense can be? Well, yeah, I think it's it, it'll be a lot easier for him. I, I think he can make it his own offense in the offseason. He can get with his receivers. He can run the plays that they're run. He can coach up guys. If new guys come in uh, in the offseason, you, you, know, you sign some acquisitions, you can get with them and start – uh, coaching them up like it's your offense and you're speaking the same language as the offensive coordinator. And so he couldn't do that last year because he uh, obviously had to come and learn it. So the more time you're in an offense, the quarterbacks can get more comfortable. And it's not it's not always, you know, knowing where to go with the ball or the reads, but it's just knowing, hey, I got a bad play here. Where's my check down? Like how to, how to get the ball out, how to uh, you know, have better better production on first and second down when things aren't there where you can go get uh, three or four yards or Daniel does a great job running the football. So I think he'll continue to just learn and get better and, and hopefully he can be in this offense and be a New York Giant for a long time. Daniel, as you know, made a lot of progress this year. What do you think is the logical next step for him in his, in his progression? Well, I think just continue to grow within this offense and, and continue to uh, find ways to be productive. Uh, I think they did a great job in the play action and moving the pocket and having him um, on some quarterback reads where he could run the ball. And he did all those things uh, very well. I think uh, you know played maybe his best game of the entire season in the playoff game at Minnesota. So that's great to see that a uh, quarterback who can step up big in the playoffs and, and play well. Um, and, you know, I think they – uh, can hopefully you know probably just grow in the in the shotgun in the in the passing game part of it and you know get comfortable with what Daniel does well what this offense coordinator what they want and what they can do as a team with all your players and and some of that is adding some pieces 
uh, around him and some players that can win some one-on-one -on -one matchups. And I thought the receivers did a lot of good things, but I think there's room to improve there. You once went through, when you were early in your career, your first offensive coordinator was John Huffnagel. Now, Tom Coughlin, of course, was an offensive-minded coach, and there was a lot of, you know, theory that the offense was primarily his philosophies and the offensive coordinators brought different um, aspects to it. The Giants currently, Mike Kafka is interviewing for head coaching jobs. If he were to leave, how big of a deal is it for a new player to come in, even though, you know, the coach is still offensive minded? Well, it just depends on who, if that happens, who gets promoted to, uh, whether it's a, there's a promotion within the offensive coordinator, they go out and sign a new offensive coordinator, how all that works. I think, you know, Brian Dable is very involved in the offense and doing things, but it's still, um, you know, it can, it can uh, change things up and on, you know, just how it works with who's in the quarterback room, who's in Daniel's ear, who's, who's doing all those things. So, um, you know, we'll have to see what happens and, and, and obviously, uh, teams deal with this all the time and and don't break you know break stride and still find ways to be really successful when guys get promoted or coordinators you know make it to head coaches and so uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll have a good plan uh, you know no matter what happens. They say that this team made progress as evidenced by the fact that they had a winning record that they made the playoffs. What is progress? How would you define progress though for year two of this team? How could they kind of top it outside of the wins and losses? Well, I think, you know, this team uh, did a great job of winning some tight games, uh, winning some fourth quarter games, making those comebacks where they were maybe down uh, in the start of the fourth quarter and, 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 and were able to, you know, overcome that and, and, and play their best football uh, at the end of games. And so you want that as a team. Um, they kind of lost that a little bit in the middle of the season, but then found it again towards the end and had some nice wins, uh, you know, versus, versus the Colts, versus uh, the Vikings in the in the playoff game, so I think it's just continue to um, to grow. You know, maybe find ways to uh, get off to better starts and not having to wait to see what the defense is doing and then react, but maybe kind of set the pace of the game and and find ways to be more productive early on. When a team goes through a stretch of losing, it can kind of bring everybody down because it's like you prepare the entire week and you don't have anything to show for it at the end at the end of the. Uh, at the end of the week. How does the team kind of build up that mental callus, if you will? I mean, this team seemed to do a good job of that. Is there a trick to that? I think if they, if you had a trick to it, then, you know, uh, you, you would print it out and, and, and write it up and make a book about it and, and sell it well, just because um, it can be tough. It can be tough to have that um, that attitude or that mental capacity that, hey, we're going to find a way to win this game no matter what. And, and that's what it's got to be where, hey, if we get off to a slow start, uh, we can still just stay patient. We're not going to force things. We're not going to, you know, dig a bigger hole for us to try to get out of. And we're going to keep it close and go win it in the fourth. And then um, it's a great mentality to have. But eventually you want to be able to, hey, we want to have the lead. We want to be able to you know, get the lead and then and then be able to change the the style of, of play that we can play at that point and, and control the lead and and win games and dominate games. So I think that's that's the mindset of where you want to get to. Uh, but you got to start somewhere with just finding ways, uh, finding ways to make it happen and win. And they were they were they did a good job of doing that. Hey, Giant fans, Valentine's Day is coming up. And if you're looking for that special one-of-a-kind piece to celebrate your special one-of-a-kind relationship, you need to check out BlueNile.com. At Blue Nile, you can find the perfect piece of jewelry for life's special moments. If you're looking for an engagement ring, you can even create it using Blue Nile's online tools to select the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as the setting style. And at any time, if you need assistance, Blue Nile has you covered with expert guidance, in-depth educational materials, and unique online tools that place you in control. Blue Nile's diamond price guarantee allows you to compare a competitor's diamond against one of theirs. And Blue Nile can even meet or beat their price. Every order ships free, is insured, and it arrives quickly in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. And right now, you can save up to 50% at BlueNile.com on select items. That's BlueNile.com for up to 50% off. BlueNile.com. 
Hey, Giant fans, Locked On is heading to the Senior Bowl. Get inside analysis from the hosts that covered the NFL's next generation in college and find out which NFL draft boards these players will be climbing all in one location. Subscribe to Locked On NFL Draft for nightly live shows from the Senior Bowl on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Shane spoke about wanting to close the gap between Philly and, and Dallas. Where do you see as being the biggest gaps they need to close? Well, I think just playing, you know, complete, you know, team, team complimentary uh, uh, games. And you saw that that Dallas, you know, defense uh, was, was dominant all year and offensively, you know, um, you know, they have playmakers at receiver, guys in the Pro Bowl. They run the ball well. So I think, you know, be able to, you know, kind of all, all, all phases working together. Philadelphia, you've seen through the playoffs, their defense, you know, been playing outstanding. They run the ball really well. Uh, and those two things complement each other. They can control the clock, shorten the game, and just wear down uh, teams. So I think uh, with the Giants, is just putting all that together. And hey, if the defense can get your turnovers, offense, you got to capitalize and you got to be able to score. You got to be able to run the clock out uh, on games you have the lead. You got to be able to, you know, play uh, a lot of different ways depending on how teams are playing you. Can you, you know, do you have a system to 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 beat it? Whether they're playing soft, they're making you run, or they're, they're they're loading up the box. Can you throw? Can you win outside? Can you win over the middle? You got to have all things working to, and, and all the right players at the right positions uh, to be able to attack however teams are playing you. A couple more before we get to Quaker Oats, Eli. What's more important, or maybe they're equally important? I don't know. But for a quarterback. Is it better to have a thousand yard rusher, a thousand yard receiver, or both? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's the ideal. Uh, <laughs> is to have both. To have uh, a running back that can, um, you know, that can get get tough yards. That could be productive. That you know, your teams have to prepare for. They have to commit to stopping the run. And so when you do that, that that sets up the one on one uh, matchups with your receivers, maybe on the outside where. Uh, you can you can still you know work with that guy. You trust he's going to win that matchup, and so you have or you feel advantages, you know, no matter what the defense is doing. And so that's that's where you see the the great offenses and great teams. It's when you know you know like I said, no matter what what style of defense you're, you're playing, you have answers, and you feel you can win those matchups. And then one more before we get to uh, the Quaker Oats thing, you're coaching against your brother in the Pro Bowl. Now, I want you to be honest with me, Eli. Who's the better coach and why? Well, I think we're going to find out. This is this is the coaching debut. We, we've, uh, you know, I have coached a little fourth grade basketball the last couple of years um, as my daughters have kind of come through, I guess, third and fourth grade basketball. Peyton's been coaching a little flag football and tackle football for his his 12-year-old son the last few years. But now, we're, we're, you know, we, we've been upgraded to the big stage. So uh, Pro Bowl, flag football. Um, kind of the first time this this game is being played as flag. So uh, there's le learning the rules, learning uh, the, the best style, how to put an offense together, how to get your guys comfortable with the offense and, and know what's going on. So there's a lot going on. But, uh, I mean, this is this is bragging rights uh, for at least a year. Who knows, who knows who's coaching next year at the Pro Bowl? If we'll be invited back. So it might be our one, you know, it might be a one and done. This is the only time we'll ever coach against each other in anything. So it's a lot on the line. All right. Now, speaking of coaching, <laughs> last I spoke with you, you were working with Quaker Oats and you were being coached pretty hard by a young lady getting pre <laughs> prepared for, you know, the campaigns. Now Quaker Oats has a, uh, a follow up to the campaign. It's called pregame. Tell us about this pregame uh, campaign that's that you're involved with. Yeah, so excited to, to partner with Quaker on this, and it's really to invite fans to share how they pre-grain before the big game for a chance to uh, attend next year's Super Bowl in Las Vegas. So basically, fans, uh, to enter the contest, can go to TikTok, they follow Quaker, and between today and February 12th, which is Super Bowl Sunday, they have to upload their own pre-grain video of how they're using Quaker Oats and use the caption hashtag Quaker pregrain hashtag entry. So you upload your video using Quaker Oats. Uh, be creative, be fun, and we'll, uh, they'll be judged. And then uh, the lucky winner gets to go 
uh, to Las Vegas to, to Super Bowl 58 next year. So that'll be uh, pretty awesome. All right. So I've got to ask, how do you pre grain I, I I just you know I'm I'm a every every morning for basically the last twelve years it's been my Quaker Quaker oats and my oatmeal with uh, some some uh, I'm a I'm a blueberry blackberry some raspberries just kind of a combination depending on whatever we have and that, that gets me gets me started every uh, every morning. And you are ready to go, obviously, with Quaker Oats powering you, ready to coach, ready to take on any of the challenges that come. No doubt. So I, I, I was prepared last year in the uh, the uh, Oat Up campaign we did with the girl coach me up. And so I've been been working on this for a couple of years. Now, I heard that the, co that, that the coaching paid off for you. So <laughs> that's great. But definitely. I needed it. I needed I need, you know, I've been retired a little bit. I need I need to get coached. I need to get coached up and and back on track. Eli, fantastic stuff. Appreciate you taking the time. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Good luck with the campaign and in the Pro Bowl. I'm secretly rooting for you against Peyton, but please don't tell him that. I will tell him. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Hey, Giant fans, we're really excited about our new sports betting partner, FanDuel, the number one sports book in America. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better because they have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so that you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a touchdown. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Best of all, you can get paid your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Hey, Giant fans, thanks again for making the Locked On Giants podcast your first listen every day. Subscribe to the Locked On NFL podcast and get daily conversations on the biggest NFL stories, plus in-depth analysis on the biggest games with the NFL's keys predictions every Friday. And Monday, local insiders cover the weekend with game-to-game -game episodes. Locked on NFL, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, everybody. I want to thank Eli Manning, as always, for coming on with me. Just absolutely love interviewing the guy. He sees terrific. And I also want to thank the good folks at Quaker Oats for making him available to talk about their initiative. Don't forget, if you want to check out Eli's uh, initiative, you can do so. I'll have the information in the show notes for you if you are interested in entering that contest for a pair of Super Bowl tickets to next year's Super Bowl. All right. Now, coming up, we're going to answer a bunch of questions submitted by one reader, or I should say one listener. Um, that's coming up right after this. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trena. It is now time for the listener mailbag portion of the podcast. And I have, uh, let's see, it looks like I have about seven questions from one particular listener, Nassim H. I think I said this correct. Nassim H is the last initial. So there's seven short questions, seven short answers. Let's do it. First question is MetLife Stadium, retractable roof. Have there been any discussions about adding a retractable roof to the stadium? No, there hasn't been, not that I'm aware of. As far as um, changes that are going to be made to MetLife Stadium, the only change, major change that I know of is they're going to replace the turf. With what surface, I don't know just yet, but that was the only thing that they're really going to work on. Um, question number two it has to do with quarterback toughness. How does quarterback build toughness if he wears a red jersey and doesn't get hit in practice? There are drills that they can do that simulate being hit and being pressured. Um, toughness is not necessarily all about taking a hit. It's about hanging in the pocket, you know, responding under pressure. So it's not just about, you know, being able to ha handle the physical aspect of it. So in the case of the Giants, what they do or what they've done at, at any rate is um, when the quarterback drops back to pass, they'll have guys with um, 
uh, for lack of a better term, they're like large padded uh, cones and they swat away at the quarterback trying to simulate, you know, defensive players trying to, you know, get their hand up and get their hands into the passing lane and hit the quarterback and so forth. So they, these pads actually make contact with the quarterback and it's designed to, you know, simulate as best as possible what a quarterback would have to do in the, uh, in a game. Uh, question number three was, uh, has to do with Steven Tish. It's unclear what his role is as an owner. And let's see, he goes on to write, the impression that I get is that John Mara runs things in New York and he runs things in LA. And what, ex what does he do exactly and what are his roles and responsibilities compared to John Mara? Steve Tisch and his family own 50% of the New York Giants. So no major decision is made without his input. Um, they might have different titles. I think John Mara is COO, Chief Operating Officer. Um, I think Steve Tisch is chairman, if I'm not mistaken. But at the end of the day, they both have the same type of responsibilities. It's just that you see John a little bit more because John is based in New York. Steve is based out in L.A. But when it comes to, you know, decisions and stuff like that, they're both 50-50. Um, they both speak for their respective families. So there's really no necessarily the divide, dividing of, um, of responsibilities. All right, you ask about cheerleaders and why the team doesn't have cheerleaders. That goes back, I think, to the days of Wellington Mara, who felt the cheerleaders were a distraction. But actually, if you Google it, I think the Giants did have cheerleaders way, way back in the day, I think for maybe a season or two. I can't remember when, but it would have to be like in the mid-1900s, I think they might have had cheerleaders. But, you know, Cheerleaders, um, as I recall, Wellington Mara felt that they would be, you know, that they were unnecessary, that they would be a distraction, that the main product should be what is on the field. And um, John Mara apparently has decided to continue that tradition, as has Steve Tisch. And uh, so, so that's um, a little history there. But look it up on Google. You'll see that there were cheerleaders for the Giants way, way back in the day. Um, I, I, and I don't remember the year, but I do remember seeing something about that. Um, let's see, you mentioned um, success, succession plan. Both John and Steve are in their 60s and 70s, while both appear to be healthy. What is the succession plan if one or both die or are incapacitated? Are their children being groomed to run the franchise? I don't know what the Tish family's plan is. Um, right now, you know, Steve represents his his sister and his brother. I think he's the oldest of three kids, but you know, I suppose they could always sell the franchise if they wanted to. They're half of the franchise, but I don't know what their plan is. I think from the Mara side, um, I want to say Tim McDonald. I'm sorry, is it Tim Mc Tim McDonald? I think it is. He's uh, the son of John's oldest sister, Susan. I think he's being groomed to eventually uh, succeed John. I think that's the plan. But again, you know, they haven't really talked about that. So, you know, that was last I heard it. Now that might have changed. I don't know. But uh, you got to remember that the Mara side of the Giants is split amongst the 11 children, unless somebody bought somebody else out. So, the more that you go down the line, the more that that uh, chunk of the Myra family is going to be divided uh, as far as ownership goes. So um, that, yeah, um, I think Timmy is, 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 I think, going to be the guy who takes over for John when the time comes. But I don't know that for sure. That's what I had heard was initially the plan. Um, <clears throat> you asked, why do GMs and owners wear suits to the game? Um, because it's a work day. I mean, even the media, we we kind of put on our work clothes. So, you know, you'll see some reporters will have, you know, jackets and ties. Um, I try to wear something a little nicer too, whether it be a dress, a skirt, a nice sweater with a nice pair of, of slacks. Uh, it, it's just a professional thing. I mean, you're, you're working. I'm not quite sure what you would expect a GM and an owner to wear. But uh, remember, they're also going to be on camera probably. And it is a working environment. You know, you, you're going to work, you know, it's, it's not like you're sitting out in the stands and, you know, you can wear your parkas and your jerseys and your sweatshirts and stuff like that. So, 
Uh, and then you, finally, you asked about Xavier McKinney. Was he suspended game checks for getting hurt uh, during the bye week? No, he was not, to my knowledge. Um, it was a mistake. He owned up to it. He didn't try to hide it. Um, you know, it, it was unfortunate that it happened. But no, the Giants did not, uh, to my knowledge, withhold any paychecks from him while he was on NFI. So to do so, what, what's the point to do so? I mean, you'd only create bad will when you have to negotiate with this young man down the line. So it, it just made no sense. So thank you for all the questions. They're different. I don't think I've ever seen these questions before. So it was nice to have something a little different to answer in the mailbag section of the podcast. All right, Giant fans, that's going to do it for me here on the Locked on Giants podcast. Again, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Eli Manning and the mailbag section. Make sure you keep it here all week long. We're going to have Senior Bowl coverage coming up. Um, Thursday, we're going to do Locked On Live. I'm going to have a, a special guest. Sam Prince is going to join me. No, he's not replacing Bad Dog and Tana. Don't panic. I'm just trying to mix it up a little bit. Um, so Sam Prince will join me, and I hope you will join me as well. Make sure you look for those details over on the YouTube channel. Thank you again for tuning in to the Locked On Giants podcast. We'll see you tomorrow, Giants fans.